As the worship team uh, is seated, why don't I ask you to turn in your Bibles to uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 6. And let me tell you how this is a Mother's Day message, okay? It just kind of fits right in, doesn't it, on Mother's Day? This is the advice that every mother ought to pass on to their son, their daughter, where the Lord is saying to us, come out, come out from among them. You know, be, be separate from them. Just because everybody else is doing it, you don't have to do it. When you look at the picture on the screen, here's the one person stepping out so that they, they are not being conformed to everybody else. But would you be willing to step out and be conformed to the Lord? That's how we ended that song. I want to be conformed to you. To yours, to yours, O Lord. Not to my will, but to yours, to yours, O Lord. And so this passage, as you look at mothers, this isn't a, a, necessarily about moms and about dads, but it's a message that moms and dads need to be giving to their kids. Come out from among them. Be separate. You know that at times you say, hey, come on, get out of there. You don't belong there. What are you doing there? Get out of there. Come out and be separate. So let me just uh, take you to the text. And let's start at verse 11. A second Corinthians chapter six, and it's where the Apostle Paul is telling how much he's he loves the people, and he said, I've, "I've spoken freely to you," and here's how he says it: "We have spoken freely to you, Corinthians, and opened wide our hearts to you. We are not withholding our affection from you, but you are withholding yours from us. As a fair exchange, I, I speak as to my children: open wide your hearts also." Do not be yoked together with unbelievers. Catch that phrase right there? That's the phrase that you're going to be sharing with your kids. God is saying it to you. You're passing it on to your kids. Don't be yoked. Do not be yoked together with unbelievers. For what do righteousness and wickedness have in common? Or what fellowship can light have with darkness? What harmony is there between Christ and Belial? Or if you're a, a good British person, what harmony is between Christ and Belial? Belial. He goes on in the text, What does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? What agreement is there between the temple of God and idols? For we are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will live with them. And walk among them, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. Therefore, come out from them and be separate, says the Lord. Touch no unclean thing, and I will receive you. I will be a father to you, and you will be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. And this chapter spills right over into chapter 7. He's making these commitments. Verse 18, I will be a father to you. And you will be my sons and daughters. Can you imagine? You are God's sons and daughters, if you know him. I'll be your father, and you can be my son. Now, if you, really, if you, if you had come from a perspective of where you didn't have a, a mom or dad, one of our people, you probably got this email, one of our people reminded me about their, the adoption they had of their children. And they had they have four children that they've adopted. They couldn't have any of their own. And when that day came, and the kids, they, they got a baby first, and then they got the two older uh, siblings. And right away, the oldest sibling at the time was eight. And he said, you know, Mom, right away when I heard your voice, I knew then, now I have a mom. If you don't have a mom, you didn't have a mom, didn't have a dad that was there all the time, can you imagine God saying, I'll be your father and you'll be my sons and my daughters. 
Now listen how it spills over into chapter 7, verse 1. Since we have these promises. What promises? That if I step out for him, I'll become his son. I'll become his child. You'll become his daughter. And he'll be your father. Since we have these promises, dear friends, what do we need to do? Let us purify ourselves. What are we just saying? Holiness, holiness is what I long for. Being purified. Let us purify ourselves from everything that contaminates body and spirit. Perfecting what? Holiness. Holiness, holiness is what I long for. What the Lord longs for. So, in spite of all the difficulty Paul had with the Corinthians, he still did what to them? He still loved them. You know the story of the Corinthian church. You know, if you go back to 1 Corinthians, and all the problems they had, divisions in chapter 1, acting like baby Christians in chapter 3, saying, oh, I like a Paul. I like Apollos better. He's a better preacher than Paul. Oh, I like... And they were divided. By the time you get to chapter 5, you have some young guy in the church having sexual relationships with his stepmom. Boy, if, if that kind of stuff were going on in our church, I'd hear about it right away. We'd be expected to do something about it right away. They had problems not knowing whether they should buy him meat that had been offered to idols. Then they were suing each other. You know, when it gets, when it gets to that, you kind of know, hey, there are problems when somebody in the church has to sue somebody out in the, else in the church for what's being done. By the time you get to chapter 11, they're, they're getting drunk at the communion service. Now, in spite of all the problems that the Corinthian church had, Paul still what? He loved them. Because he was their spiritual dad. He's the one that led them to the Lord. And remember, here's how he words it to them. Verse 11, We have spoken freely to you, Corinthians, and opened wide our hearts to you. We are not withholding our affection from you. But you are withholding yours from us. Some parents have felt that at times. They're loving and loving and loving their kids, and, and their kid turns right at them and says, I hate you! And the parent says, you know, I'm not withholding my affection from you. Why are you holding, withholding yours from, from me? The question I have is, why? why? Why would they withhold their affections? Well, because they had reached the place in their lives where they had divided loyalties. They had divided hearts. Their hearts were torn apart. They were in love with the world. And they wanted to be in love with the Lord, his word. And when you have those divided loyalties, then when somebody comes at you with the truth, if you're in love with the world, you don't want to hear the truth. And so when you hear the truth, then you kind of pull back from him. And he, he says, I haven't withheld my love from you, but you're withholding yours from me. And so they have these divided loyalties, the world pulling one way, the word of God hammering and cutting through on the other side. Let me put it this way on the screen, okay, side by side. When Satan wants to deceive you, he always wants to give you a counterfeit. And a counterfeit is only um, as good as it can come close to the original, the real thing. If you're going to sell some paintings by uh, the painter of light and you try to do knockoffs, you want to come as close as possible to the real thing. If you want to hand off counterfeit money, you don't hand off monopoly money. You don't take that down to Best Buy and think that they're going to they're accept it. You come as close as you can to the real thing. In our English language, on the screen is a great illustration of how Satan attempts 
to come as close as he can to the real thing. If I could just eliminate one letter there, it's what God wants for everybody. The word to be in our lives. But Satan attempts to slip the world in. And you think, oh, what? it's got to be good. God loves the world. Isn't that the famous verse for God so loved the world? Therefore, we should love it too. And when he's talking about him loving the world, it's the people of the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. So God loves people. He doesn't love what goes on in the world. And he starts to define it a little differently. It's not a problem for us to be in the world. It's the problem occurs when the world gets into us. I've said before, it's not a problem for the boat to be in the water. It's a problem when the water gets into the boat. And when the world gets into you, you start to sink. Here's what James says about the world, James 4.4. 4, you adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world is hatred towards God? Anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes a what? An enemy of God. He says it, Paul says it this way in uh, Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds. John says it this way in, in 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 and 16. Do not love the world or anything in the world. If any man loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. That's verse 15. That spills over into verse 16 that says it this way. For everything in the world, now he's going to really define. What's the difference here? If God loves the world, and if we're not to love the world, God doesn't love this part of the world. For everything in the world, the cravings of sinful man, the lust of his eyes, and the what? The boasting of what he has and does. Comes not from the Father, but from where? The world. So you've got cravings, lusts, and boasting. And he says, I don't love that. That pulls people away from God, and he wants you to stay close to his word. And Satan says, oh, let's get you close to the world. So here's what the text says, verse 14. Do not be what? Yoked together with unbelievers. Here's the Greek word for yoked together. First part of the word, uh, heteros. This very first part. Uh, Zuguntest uh, is the second part of the word, heterods, zuguntest. This is the root from which it comes, heterods, zugeo. Let me just highlight that first part. I said the first part is heteros. It means different. We use it in many English words, but ones that you are probably familiar with look like this. Heterosexual. If someone has a homosexual re relationship, it's the same sex and with man. If it's a heterosexual relationship, it's man with woman. Hetero means what then? Different. We use it also on this word, uh, heterogeneous group. Most of the time we don't even use this word. Here's it in a sentence. The party was attended by a heterogeneous group of artists, politicians, and social climbers. All sorts of different kind of people. When we talk about groups, we say, oh, it was a, a homogeneous group. A homogeneous group meaning they're all the same kind of, you know, thoughts. Uh, this group really liked, for instance, um, country western music. They all had that same, they all liked it. It was a homogeneous group. Or if they had kind of the same socioeconomic background, they were of the homo, same homogeneous group. But if it's a heterogeneous group, it means that everybody's kind of different, has different thoughts and different ideas. So the first part of this word, heterodzungeo, heterods, different. The second part of the word looks like this. Let me highlight it. Zungeo. And zungeo means I am yoked. This little omega on the end is I am I am yoked with someone. The word for yoke looks like this. Zugas. And it means 
yoked to something. And a yoke is, is what you see on oxen, where they're tied together. So if I could just take and flip these words up over, you'd see what this word means. It means I'm yoked to something different than me. And if I'm a Christian, he's saying, don't be yoked to people who have a different, they don't believe, they're unbelievers. Or you're going to get in trouble. Let me go back to the Old Testament where he uses this as a point to illustrate this. So when you're talking to this, your kids about this, here's a real strange passage. In Deuteronomy chapter 22, verse 10, it says this, Do not plow with an ox and a donkey yoked together. Now, in the same passage, in another Old Testament passage, it says several things you're not to do. Don't plant two types of seed in the same field. And don't uh, wear clothing mixed of two kinds of fabric. And don't plow with an ox and a donkey. And don't mate different kinds of animals. Now, we understand that uh, a little bit, but it's kind of vague to us. I mean, well, what's wrong with planting two different kinds of seeds? Or what's wrong with having polyester and cotton? You don't have to iron it then. <laughs> but really what he was trying to do is give us a picture. Remember, the Old Testament's a shadow of things to come. Not a really clear picture, but a shadow of things to come where he's going to really be clear and defined. And so he's trying to say, don't mix things together. So the question I have for you is this. Why would it be wrong to, to plow with an ox and a donkey? You know, what's, what is going on that, that don't do that? Well, let me give you the first reason that it comes to my mind. For a Jewish person, an ox was a clean animal and a donkey was an unclean animal. Now, for me, all animals are dirty. <laughs> you know, but that's not what he's talking about here, whether they're clean on the outside uh, or dirty. They're dirty. We get dirty. And so he's talking about the, the kind of foods you can eat. That's why we... You know, we don't normally eat horse meat because it's classified as an unclean animal in Scripture. You know, at least we don't knowingly eat, eat a lot of horse meat. I've chewed some meat that it felt like I was chewing. You know, they say, you know, when a horse dies, they make it into what? What? Yeah, good dog food. <laughs> and glue. No, so I, I've chewed, it felt like I was chewing some of that, you know, because you're just chewing that rubber kind of stuff. But he's saying, look, there are some animals that God says are clean and some that are unclean. And he goes to the, the, the area of disease in, in that sense. So, you know, pigs would have a disease that, that would quickly and easily spread, trichinosis or other diseases. That's why in the Old Testament he said, you know, you'll have none of these diseases if you follow what I have. And, and when today, when, when even people have difficulty in their stomach today and digesting, what do, they, what do they say to kind of do away with? Pork items, ham items, things that are harder to digest. But he's saying, look, trichinosis is something that can really, you know, spread. So there used to be, and in the last service, let me see if anybody has in this service, used to be that you, when you killed an animal, especially a wild animal, if you were hunting or something, you could only do it in months that had, anybody know where I'm going with this? Had the letter, somebody said, the letter R in it. Because it was the, it moved towards the colder months of the year. And, and when you killed it, the meat wouldn't go bad as quickly especially when you get in November, December, you know, so you, just people had different ideas of the way to handle that, of unclean foods. So, we don't usually eat unclean foods. About the only time you eat crow is when you make a mistake, you know? <laughs> and, and we don't say, man, I could, I, I had to eat turkey on that one. You don't say that because you do eat turkey. But, you don't eat crow, and why don't you eat crow? Because it feeds on what? It's just a scavenger. It feeds on your garbage. 
And then you cook it and go, oh, this is tasty. Yeah, it's, he, was, he was eating some of my turkey. It's, just, it's a scavenger. And so it's kind of an unclean animal. But we, when you talk about ham and stuff, because we can cook it better today, we can kill the disease that it may have otherwise had. And we try to maintain health standards that are better than they were able to do before. But the idea of something unclean and clean. Other things that we eat that, that are unclean. Uh, you ever had lobster? Do you know what lobster feeds on? <laughs> yeah, they, they know back over here. And the rest of you don't want to know. Uh, but when you cook it, so here's what happens. For Jewish people, he's saying, look, you don't yoke together an animal that's clean and an animal that's unclean. For a Jewish person, you want, what kind of a kitchen do you want to have? Louder, everybody. A kosher kitchen. One that doesn't mix, you know, some of these things that can create disease. You know, and some really good, um, strict Jewish homes, they won't even use the same knife for, you know, let's say, milk products and cutting meat. So that you don't, you need to keep a kosher, a clean kitchen. So he's saying, look, don't mix these. What's the picture? That if you hook up, if you are committed, if you are yoked with an unbeliever, it's those who have been cleansed by the blood and those who are still in their sin. But let me give you some other... Now, this is a New Testament passage on this, 2 Corinthians six seventeen. When the Apostle Paul says, come out from among them, here's what he says. Therefore, come out from them and be separate, says the Lord, and do what? Touch no unclean thing. Got it? Now, Peter, when the Lord lowered the net in, in uh, the book of Acts, and he saw all these unclean animals, and the Lord says, Peter, take and eat. And Peter's looking at that, and he says, I'm a... Good Jewish boy, Lord. I've never eaten any of that. I'm not supposed to eat those unclean things. And God says, you know what I made? Don't call thou unclean. Because he was getting him ready to go to the Gentile people who the Jewish people had called unclean for years. But he's saying, look, if you're a believer and you partner up, if you yoke together with unbelievers, what happens? You're putting clean with unclean when it comes to some issues. We'll talk about that more. Second reason, why don't you put an ox plowing with a donkey? Because the gait of the animals would be different. You, you've seen it happen. I, my wife and I go walking on occasion. She goes more often than I do. But when, when you walk with somebody that has longer legs... What does the shorter-legged person have to do? Man, they're, they're just going like this, you know. <laughs> and they're just, and, and you're taking like three foot steps, and they're taking two foot, you know, steps, and they're having to, the gait is different. Their stride is different. Now, I wish that were really true. When my wife and I walk, you know, I'm going like this. <laughs> and so she could keep up, but she's wanting to go like this. You know, because she's wanting exercise, and I don't like exercise, do you? <laughs> but we do it. The gait is different. And look, if you're hooked up, if you're connected, if you're yoked with an unbeliever, what happens? They're going one pace and one direction, and you're going, you should be going in another direction. But since you're yoked to them, you've got to go with them. Let me give you another reason. Because the strength of the animals would be mismatched. You take a 1,000 pound, a 1,200 pound bull, and you're going to have it plow in the field, and you take a 400 or 500 pound donkey, and what do you have? You have this mismatch that's not going to pull together and what is God saying? Don't put an ox with a donkey. Let me give you one last reason I thought. Because the nature of the animals would be different. 
What's the one word that comes to your mind when you think of a donkey? Its nature is stubborn. When you think of a cow, an ox, depends on whether you've got a bull or a, you know, a cow. A cow may be a little fearful. and timid. The bull may just say, hey, get out of my pasture. Put its head down and come after you. But the donkey can just be stubborn. The other thing it says in this Old Testament text, when it talks about uh, don't, uh, don't plant two seeds in the same field, don't use two different kinds of clothing, cloth in your clothing, uh, or fa- fabric in your clothing, and it says don't mate different animals. You know, you mate a cow you know, with, with a cow, a bull with a cow. You mate horses together. You mate elks together. You mate... But in our society, they, you know, they always try to do something a little bit, you know, get a hybrid of some kind. So in the past, they, they thought, well, how about a horse and a donkey? And they've done that. And you get some offspring. What do we call that offspring? A mule. And that mule technically can't reproduce itself. It's sterile. Now, you know, I, it's hard to know on the internet whether you can really verify a lot of things. They say that worldwide uh, there are some 60 mules that have been able to reproduce over a period of time. But apart from that, all the rest of them out there have been sterile. They can't reproduce. So what's the picture? If you put a believer and an unbeliever together, what are your chances of reproducing something that's going to he says, look, you're not going to because one's going to be in this direction and one's going to be in that direction. So he, he gives us as the background to this text. You don't yoke them together. The New Testament's talking about do not be, what? Yoked together. Here's a picture of this yoking. Can you, I mean, it, I wouldn't even want to have to carry the yoke. I mean, it's, it's a heavy piece and it has to be strong enough. Why? Because you're going to hook the plow to it and when you have, you know, these animals weigh uh, 800 to 1,100 pounds each, and they're pulling on that, on that plow, it snapped the yoke right apart. And so what is he saying? Look, you need to teach your kids, you need to understand yourself, folks, that when you yoke yourself to an unbeliever, you get into difficulty. So he says it in verse 14, do not be what? Yoked together with unbelievers. So what's he saying? Here's a sermon in a sentence. As believers, we need to separate ourselves from unbelievers. Now I'm going to spend a couple of weeks on this so you can understand really, first of all, that this principle is true. And then how does that then live out when you've got all these unbelievers in the world if you're not supposed to be yoked with them? This text is going to give you five questions that if you answer them correctly, you're going to reach the same conclusion that I have, that God is right when it comes to this matter. And, you know, I found that he's, he's right on everything, you know. But if he's telling you not to be yoked with unbelievers, then let's ask these questions and see how we come to the same conclusions. Let's go back to the text. Do not be yoked together with unbelievers. First question, for what do righteousness and wickedness have in common? Second question, or what fellowship can light have with darkness? Verse 15, third question, what harmony is there between Christ and Belial? Fourth question, what does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? Verse 16, what agreement is there between the temple of God and idols? So what is he saying? Look, we need to separate. And he's going to raise these questions. The first question is this, what partnership does righteousness and wickedness have in common? Now, this is in verse 14. And on this, on the screen, I put the New American Standard. And the reason I put the New American Standard is the NIV, which most of us use. The NIV, uh, which is a, let me just drop this in. It's, it's a, they call it a, the d- dynamic equivalent translation. Because words constantly change, we need to have the dynamic equivalent today to understand it. So if I, you know, years ago when you said, oh, cool, that meant it was cold. 
You know what? Today it means, oh man, they, they look nice. Hey, that's cool. Oh, she's sharp. You know? And it used to mean what when it first came out? You could get cut with it. But you know, now it means that how you look. So we use the dynamic equivalent. In this case, the NIV left out this word completely. This word, do not be bound together with unbelievers for what? Partnership. It's in the text, but they've just left the word out completely and just, and just said it this way. Uh, what does righteousness and lawlessness have in common? But he's trying to get you to understand it's a partnership. It's a marriage. Here's the Greek word that's used for that partnership, uh, metake. It's only used one time in Scripture. And it's right here. And he's saying, listen, you're in a partnership. Some people think it's a synonym for koinonia, fellowship. But this is a specific Greek word that's used here one time. A very similar word to this. Look at this word. This is metake. I want to show you the next word is Metakos. They're really close. But it's found in the Gospels. Metakos is. And in both cases, it's partnership. In Luke chapter 5, in verse 7, Jesus, let me just put it on the screen here so you have it. Jesus is talking and calling out his disciples. <clears throat> They're going to serve him. And he's talking to Peter, and they're along the Sea of Galilee, and Peter's been fishing all night, and they haven't caught anything. And so the Lord's challenging them to become his partners. And he said, hey, along the way, why don't you uh, go out and let's go for some more fishing? And Peter says, Lord, we've fished all night, and how much have we caught? Nothing. And so he says, well, let's go out. Your word, I'll go out and do it. So they launched out on the lake and they start catching fish. Man, fish, fish, and more fish. They're getting so many fish in their boat that here's what the text says. So, verse 7. So they signaled their what? Their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. This is the Greek word, metakos. You're a partner. You're doing something where you are tied together in business. Peter, James, John, and Andrew, tied together in business. They're partners. You know, when I think of how many fish, how many fish it takes, this is a successful fishing trip. When you are filling your boat to where it's sinking, that's a good day fishing. Or a long day and night of cleaning. Because <laughs> you're going to have a mess on your hands. So one time, my dad and I, we, when we used to live in Indiana, they used to have, uh, right on Lake Michigan, a, one of the towers for the energy plant. And so they'd bring the water in for one of these uh, kind of nuclear power plants where they'd bring the water in from the lake to cool the, the system down. It gets put back out into the lake. The water that goes back out in the lake is warm. Where the warm water is, the fish go, whew, this feels really nice in the middle of winter. And so the fish would come to that area. The fish in that area would be salmon. And they would be, you know, really nice, long, weighty salmon. Like this, this big around, they'd be 35 pounds. And then in the spring, they'd go up what was known in that area as Trail Creek. People could fish when they, when they were going up the creek. Why were they going up the creek? To lay their eggs. And they're going up. After they lay their eggs, what do they do? They die. So why not let people catch them? They're just going to die anyway. So there was a... The, the creek is just a little bitty creek, but there are pocketed areas that are like pools. And one of those pocketed areas is just about as big as our auditorium right here. And when you'd go there to fish, you'd come up on the bridge area where it is, and cars after cars after car would be there. And there'd be a, a minimum of 25 people fishing around. 
this little hole. And of course, you'd cast your line out there. And, and then if a fish would bite that line, the guy would holler out, Fish on! Because then now the fish is going to take off. It's on his line. And you know what that fish will do? He'll circle around everybody else's line. <laughs> What a mess. The guys are pulling up. Oh, fish on, fish on. Everybody's hollering fish on because they got a hit too. But what it's doing is it's just catching everybody else's line. And now they're all, and you come up like this and you got the line of the guy across. It's a straight line. You know, your line right out of the water, right over to their line. We, could, we didn't catch much of anything. Somebody in my church said, hey, I live way back on Trail Creek here. Why don't you come out and you'll get fish. You can't hook them. And they're not very hungry. I mean, you can't, hook, you can't snare them, is what I meant by hooking them. They have to, to bite on the hook. And so I went out with my dad and I said, if we don't catch fish tonight, we don't belong fishing. And the fish were in a stream about as wide at some points as the center aisle. And about as deep as this. And their backs are sticking out of the stream because they're so big. And you're going, goodness, this. <laughs> now, that, my wife doesn't do that with fish, you know. And so we got, you can only keep five at a time. So we got five of them. And, you know, we, we had, you know, a couple hundred pounds of fish in those five fish. Can you, those fish are just sitting in the stream going, because they've come up for a breather at that point. You know, they fought their way all at the stream. You're going, here, fishy, fishy, fishy. <laughs> you know, <laughs> trying to just lace the hook in his mouth. Yeah. My dad, you know how tall my dad was, you know, about 5'2". When those fish really got going, you know, they'd snap up through that stream and they would be flopping everywhere. And my dad goes running up the bank and Doug went running right up after him. Of course, at that point, Doug was about 5 or 6. And the people that on the stream, that, that lived right near the stream, they said, oh, you can use our fish net. That first fish went right through that net. That net was so old, you know, it, it was 100 years old, you know, and you hook it through and it bloop, right through the bottom. They had a successful time, but they were partners. And what did the Lord tell them when it was all done? Why don't you leave this and I'll make you Fishers of men. Why don't you partner up with me? Here's a prisoner. <clears throat> handcuffed in the back. Police officer on one side. Police car behind him. Question I have for you is this. Would you expect these guys to ever become partners in crime? A, a police officer and a criminal? And the obvious answer is what? No. He's saying, well, then why do you, as a believer, want to partner up with an unbeliever? Because what we should be doing is what? Coming out. What partnership? Have righteousness and what? Lawlessness. That's what he uses in the text. Nomos is the Greek word for law. It's embedded into the word Deuteronomos, Deuteronomy. And Deuteronomy, duet, the second giving of the Namas law. So the book of Deuteronomos, Deuteronomy, is the second time the, the Ten Commandments were given because Moses broke them the first time. In this text, the letter A is put in front of Namas. And when you put that letter A in front of it, you're like an theist is someone who believes in God, an atheist, someone who doesn't. A Gnostic is someone that says knowledge. An agnostic says you can't get the knowledge to know. Someone that uh, is against the law is a lawless person. And you're following God's laws and they're lawless. You're a part of the police force and they're part of the criminal element. Why are you partnering up with them? So what does he say? As believers, what? We need to separate ourselves from unbelievers. He goes on. 
raises five questions so that you can reach the conclusion. First one is this. What partnership does righteousness have with wickedness? What do they have in common? None. Second question. What fellowship can light have with darkness? So now he's going to use nouns as he walks his way down through the text. You have partnership. You have fellowship. And here, what fellowship can light have with darkness? 2 Corinthians 6.14, he ends this verse. What fellowship can light have with darkness? Light and darkness have always been used in Scripture as an indication of what God wants to do and what the world wants to do. What's one of the first things God made? God said, let there be light. And he saw the light, and it was good. But John tells us men love rather than because their deeds are evil. So he says, what are, what are you doing? You're part of the light now. Why would you want to be part of the darkness? In John chapter 8, verse 12, Jesus says it this way. When Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. He uses seven I am's in the Gospel of John. This was one of them. I'm the light of the world. So if you're connected to him, you're part of the light. You ought to be sharing, shedding the light. We are salt and light in this world. He says, let your... Light, so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven, Matthew 5, 16. So here he says, when Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I'm the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Let me give you this question. Would you ever knowingly just run headlong into something that would hurt you? You know, if, if there was a concrete wall out here, would you ever say, okay, I'm going to run, I'm going to sprint as fast as I can, and I'm just going to slam into that concrete wall? Now, you may do it if you are in the dark. Some of you have done this a few times uh, as you got out of bed in the night and you stubbed your toe. Oh, and you can't, oh, 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 and you're limping along. How do I know that? Because I've watched my wife. <laughs> no, not really. But if you're in the dark, you have difficulty. You know, when I was a young kid, I used to be like in the Cub Scouts and the Boy Scouts, but when I was in the Cub Scouts, and, and I, I was somewhere between, oh, eight and ten years of age, we went out to an event out on one of the farms of our people that they had put up a, a mobile home, like a, a trailer or a mobile home that they used kind of for the summertime. And they got, a, you know, out of town, out of our town. They, they, went out, they went from the city out to the country, you know, to get away. Our town had 500 people, so I kind of laugh when they had to get out of town. You know, it was crowded, you know. So they, they invited all the Cub Scouts out there, and it was night, and we, we roasted hot dogs and had a great time. And then it was time for a kick the can or some games like that. I don't remember the games. But it's a wooded area, and kids are running everywhere, and it's, it's the nightmare I always have when we get up to camp at, our, at Camp Faith because I you know, want to really protect, protect the kids. We're running everywhere, and I'm running. And of course, I'm about oh, four feet nothing, you know. And, and I'm running along and trying to run away from somebody. And all of a sudden, a boom, I get hit right about at my neck level. And I'm just leveled right down to the ground. You know, I just hit something, it hits me here, and boom, down I go. And I get up, and I start running a little more. And, but then I... I'm feeling something wet up here. And so I get back to the, the leadership and, and where the light, because it was night. I get back to the leadership where the lights are and I got blood coming out here because what had happened along the way is I had run right into a barbed wire fence and it got me right at the throat. There was nothing underneath of it. Here, there's some fencing underneath it, but I just you know ran right into that in my throat and it just upended me. And it's because I was in the dark. And what I'm saying to you, and the Lord says it this way, you know, what, what are you doing? What fellowship can light have with darkness? You just need to warn your kids and you that men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. But don't hang there. And if you 
yoke yourself with an unbeliever, it's like light and darkness. So, separate. He's going to ask you five questions. First one is this. What partnership does righteousness have with lawlessness, wickedness? What fellowship can light have with darkness? Thirdly, what harmony is there between Christ and Belial? Another word for Satan. So you've got partnership. You've got fellowship. You've got harmony. Here's the verse. Verse 15, what harmony, harmony is there between Christ and Belial, Belial? Here's the Greek word that's used in this text. We have an English word that comes almost directly from this. The sigma here in the Greek becomes an S in English. The upsilon becomes a Y. The mu becomes an N. The phi becomes a PH sound. The omega, you can hear the omega, what English word, letter? O. The new makes the N, and we add the Y. And we have a symphony. And a symphony, so that's why the NIV uses the word, what harmony? What harmony is there? If, if they're singing off key, and you're, you've been put in tune with the Lord... What kind of harmony can you have there? So the question I have, would you expect harmony between Christ and Satan? The obvious answer is, no, no way. And so what he's saying to you today is this. And I told you we're going to kind of deal with this in two parts, so we'll come back and look at more at this next week. Are you willing to step out? Or do you have to be like everybody else in the world? Or can you ask him to keep you near the cross? The world wants to pull you away from the, the cross. Could you just say, oh, Lord, keep me near that?